So here it is, um, Mrs. Gayola, uh, really a servant of the faith, has been uh, working with um, many, many venues of promoting the faith, but one of the recent uh, projects he's been working on is to bring the Baha'i teachings uh, into the school districts. And an opportunity came up and she was able to start what is called the Palmaris. Um, preschool kids. So that program caught on so well that it just received three awards. I was there when she was receiving the awards and the superintendent was so excited that said, you know, I wish we could put this into research because then once it has evidence base data that it works, then I can take it and move on with it to other school districts. And I said, say no more because we have already started the research and what we're presenting in the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque in October. And her, uh, his eyes just went open and said, I need that, I need that. Finish it and give it to me so I can promote this program. So that is a wonderful program. If anybody's interested in internship and doing internship with uh, Mrs. Gilman, I think you're always open to new interns, right? And know more about the program, please see her. So maybe you can start something like that in your uh, district, school district, with uh, her help, I'm sure. So I'll say no more. I know you're all excited to hear Mrs. K. Mangiola, and there she is. Mike is all yours. Well, thank you so much. Oh, my God. It's good to have a lot of friends. And I look around and I see Leah. <laughs> I see a lot of you and your faces radiant and it comes, brings me a lot of energy. So this is a pleasure to share with you learnings and challenges of how as Baha'is we look into the whole field of psychotherapy um, for those who want to go and become psychotherapists and for those who, for whatever reason, we need to go and seek the services of psychotherapists. And the House of Justice tells us that Baha'is need to refer to professionals for their help and for their health. We are supposed to go to the skilled physicians. However, this field of psychotherapy, because it has to do with the mind and the heart and the body and the family and the community. It is a lot more complex. And as a result, I think that Baha'is, we need to be a lot more consoled of what we consume and what we listen to and who do we go to. Because um, unlike all other groups out there, we have an ocean of guidance and information that is about how we conduct our minds, our hearts, our spirits, and out there, the field, the science, has yet to travel a long distance before it can even acknowledge who we are as human beings. Okay, so I'm hoping that we can get a little teaser, just like when you go to Costco, <laughs> and, and, and then they put a little table in there and they give you a little taste. That's all it is. <laughs> and so if you have questions, um, just write them down. And if you want to raise your hand in the middle, it's fine with me. Before we start, I would like to give you a, a very little exercise. So is everybody ready? Yes. Okay, this is experiential. <laughs> so I want you to close your eyes. And as you close your eyes, Say to yourself 10 times, um, I have a problem, a stumbling block. I am facing a problem, a stumbling block. Just say it 10 times, keep your eyes closed, and just notice how your feelings, your heart rate, your body kind of responds to that internalization or self-suggestion that I have a problem. That's all. So, ready? Take a deep breath and um, just keep saying it to yourself. You don't have to say it loud. Just keep saying it to yourself ten times. Okay, I see a bunch of people opening their eyes. That means that they said it. And um, so, mm, I'm curious to know how you felt. Um, did it change? Anything changed in you? Did you feel a um, sense of worry, maybe distress, whatever, um, any changes. So now 
I want you to stand up. And then just wiggle yourself a little bit. And then sit again. And this time take a deep breath and say to yourself 10 times, I have an opportunity before me. I have an opportunity before me. Just say it 10 times. I have a stepping stone in front of me, an opportunity. See what happens. Okay, I see that everybody almost is done. The eyes are open. So, uh, just for your own self, did you register any difference in your inner experience just by saying these two different sentences? So keep that in your mind, just remember it, make a note of it somewhere. We'll visit why, why is it that I asked you to do this and what's the significance of this very brief exercise. I need a reader. So I'm going to ask this wonderful person who came to see me. So she's going to be my reading person. Yeah. The good news about psychotherapy is that the average treated client is better off than 80% of the untreated sample. The bad news, however, is that there has been no improvement in psychotherapy outcomes in more than 30 years, that the dropout rates are very high, 47 to 50%, and that there is a lack of consumer confidence in therapy outcome. There is a continued emphasis on the medical model and there are continued claims of superiority amongst models despite the absence of, Edison, of evidence. Thank you so much. So as you see, this is um, from a very new face, Federica Banik. Reason, the field of psychotherapy has um, expanded. I have been practicing 25 years. I remember the first day when I went to the graduate school and interviewed with the head of the department. I was coming from a background of um, my previous life. I was an economic consultant. I actually believe it or not, with the government of Iran. <laughs> And, uh, and uh, then I had children. I decided that I wanted just to dedicate my time to, the, to raising my children. So they were my main focus. And then my youngest one, Nava, who just got married and she's 33, when she was um, five, I decided I need to um, find a field where I can um, serve the faith with the question that always had been in my mind. How do we bridge the mystical, the spiritual ocean of the knowledge of the writings of the faith and the whole culture of it with science? How do we have this language that they, we can talk with um, other scientists but use these two uh, worlds together, bridge them, not separate? And I thought the whole field of recognizing who we are here was very important to me. And the writings of the face, so much information about it, but that language was completely foreign to a psychotherapist or psychologist if I wanted to use that. Was, what are you talking about? So I thought the best way to do it is for me to go get a degree and work and then figure it out. So, so I go over there and she says, <laughs> so <laughs> why are you here? Obviously, you know, I wasn't coming out of high school. So I said, well, you know, I have, um, I've grown up as a Baha'i in Iran, and I have studied the Baha'i writings of, um, for many years, and now I am really interested to see how spiritual laws and concepts can come together with the science of psychotherapy. She got really upset. <laughs> I mean, she really was like, no S word here. And I thought, oh my goodness. And she said, if you want to be in the program, can, you can, but you're not going to be bringing anything to do with spiritual whatever. I said, okay, that's, don't worry about it, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> so when I was in grad school, boy, I tell you, everybody, after a while, everybody came married, because this was more, so a lot of adults coming from other professions, lawyers, teachers, whoever it was. They had come, they were changing careers. 
and most of them were married and have children. And it didn't take very long when I see everybody in, in, around me are divorcing. And I'm thinking, this is not you know, something just one or two or three. Everybody, all my classmates, 40, 50 of them are divorcing. And, and then I realized that the whole notion was marriage is dead and God is dead. Everybody was dead. <laughs> And I was so grateful that every time in the evening, once a week, we had assembly, I would just dash to the assembly to, just to hear a few prayers so I could get my balance back and see what, what, what was going on because it was really unsettling. Really, it was unsettling too. Because when you're in an environment that everybody is falling off the cliff, you might start wondering, well, you know, maybe I'll be falling off the cliff too. So obviously there was nothing I could get from them at that time. Um, it was not even allowed to go into that area of concept of spiritual. Well, I had to wait. Uh, what I'm observing now is the field has expanded and of course um, because of many, many elements, including science itself, especially neuroscience. Um, and also curiosity of a lot of Americans. Believe it or not, majority of the American um, psychotherapists, um, family if you want to call it that, guess what religion do they follow? Take a guess. Huh? They are Buddhists. And, and it's very interesting because as a Baha'i, we all studied all these religions, right? And when you look at um, people, we go to India, I was there in 69, you go to India, um, Buddhism doesn't have, as far as a society is concerned, as, as, as a culture is concerned, has got all the ills that all the other religions have, as far as I'm concerned, you know. Um, divorces, superstition, backwardness, so whatever else is there. So interesting that this, this group of our um, colleagues, my colleagues, uh, I think that they found a, a frame that they could themselves uh, pick and choose how they would be able to believe. So it's like a homesteading. You know how early on in this country people would go and find a place and they could homestead, they could do it whichever way they wanted. So I think it gives them freedom from the, um, the, um, the rigidity of what religion has become. And I think also, I think as Baha'is, we haven't done our job to really, as you know, Abdul Ha says, take this Joseph, you know, he refers to Baha'u'llah. Baha'u'llah, Yuval, has been referred in the writing as Joseph. And he says, Abdul Ha said, take this Joseph to Egypt and sell him, sell him. We don't know how to do that. We are not so good at it. So, as a result, we haven't made the dent that we should. So, one other thing I realized is that my Baha'i colleagues, um, because there's so much work to do in order to integrate, the faith into the practice, especially if they work for an organization, they are, when they come out of school, they have to go and do the research and practice and take the, all the chances they have to take in order to integrate the process of doing the writings into the process of psychotherapy. So you need a mentor, you need um, an organization that allows you to do that. And uh, I learned that the hard way when I invited one of my colleagues who did some workshops with me, and somebody called me and said, do you know so and so, and anybody who has, who's a Baha'i who integrates the writings into their process? And I said, well, she, she presented with me, most likely she does. I said, yeah, so and so, go, go talk to so and so. And um, she called me, my colleague called me, says, no, I, I just practice the way everybody else does. I'm not integrating anything. I, I don't know how to do that, and my work doesn't allow me anyways. So, so I learned my lessons that that's not something that people just jump in and do. So I'm always fascinated with the way the whole field is opening, converging, opening, converging. So it has come a long ways. Now you have mindfulness meditation going viral everywhere and all those things, which is great. 
So I, um, I'm looking at the whole basis of the, the, the um, gap between a Baha'i-minded, inspired psychotherapy with a non -Baha'i. And at the base of it is one thing, one big missing link. And I'll let you think about it. I'll tell you later as we go. In the field, I see a very interesting development coming. And this, by the way, that you read, is from this um, new uh, psychotherapist who um, has kind of mixed a positive psychology, cognitive behavioral approach, and solution-oriented, all of these together, which all of them can be, by the way, compatible with the Baha'i way of thinking, considering the base of it that I told, that missing link needs to be in place. But um, she is opening up a new way, and she's in Europe, and now she's training a lot of people. So positive psychology, for your information, is it going in the right direction? And the reason is exactly what she did. Remember at the beginning, when you start to say to yourself, I have a problem, I have a problem, I have a problem, what happened? You, right there, your wings become droopy, your mind starts feeling a burden, you don't become your full self. You're no longer your whole, strong, powerful self. And that is the mode that most psychotherapy goes into in order to, so they're very much um, aiming for pathology. Where is pathology? I don't think that's what the, the writings does not really go that direction. Um, so, um, Benick has, has seen that now she's opening the door. So I, I really like her side in that. And as you see, she's radiant. So you want to read it? Dr. Frederick Bannock, MPR, is a clinical psychologist and a master of dispute resolution based in Amsterdam. She is an internationally recognized CBT, positive psychology, cognitive behavioral therapy, positive psychology solution focused presenter and trainer, and the author of more than 25 books. She's also a mental health trainer for Doctors Without Borders. Well, that's a good stop. So as long as we know what are some of the fields that are more uh, uh, accommodating of the way we think as Baha'is, I think that's a good stop. So positive psychology is a good, good way. Some of you who have mm, heard my talks, you're familiar with this star. Mm, the five-pointed star is the symbol of what? The Baha'i the the faith. Okay. And um, it really corresponds to all of these positive psychology, um, cognitive behavior uh, approach, uh, solution-oriented, all of that. Also, how many of you are members of this spiritual assemblies? Okay, so it goes to the prayer. It says, when you say that prayer at the beginning of the assembly, that our thoughts, our views, our feelings may become as one reality, manifesting the spirit of union throughout the world. That means those nine people who are sitting there, and Cynthia are sitting there, we served on the assembly together for many years. Those nine people, unless they say that prayer and they really, really bring their minds together and their views, our thoughts, our feelings become as one reality until that happens. That is not a spiritual assembly. That's just nine people sitting there and God knows they might be bickering about something and consultation will not be happening because just because nine bodies are there and every mind is going in one direction and they, maybe they came out um, uh, after arguing with so-and-so or having some problem at work, it doesn't mean that we are fit to be the channel for what is supposed to be happening, which is the business of Baha'u'llah's community. Kidding? <laughs> it's not a joke. <laughs> Spiritual seven. So now let's let's take a look at this. Um, how many of you have seen this, by the way? You're familiar. Because I put, by the way, I put my videos on my channels on YouTube because I think whoever wants to go, they can look at it, they can take it, they can learn from it, which is great. Um, and I'm hoping that a lot of young people will go take it and go into the field and then come out and do the research and change the field because that's what that's the way it happens. So as I'm talking, I'm going to draw it because I need it later on as we refer to it. So the star is um, five-pointed. Um, <laughs> and don't you expect a perfect shape. <laughs> it's going to not happen. 
Okay. So, it's true, that's five points, that's all you think. So this part is sense, perception. That means we detect reality with our five senses. Abdul Bahar refers to it as our physical powers. Either we see it, we smell it, we taste it, we touch it, and what else? Yeah. Yeah. Hear it. Very good, you guys with me. So, this is basically, we say, what happens. Things happen in the world, right? And we also have feelings. Our thoughts, our views, our feelings. There's feeling, a whole bunch of feelings, about three, four hundred words for feelings. And then intentions, or wants, or desires, all of those. But I put intentions because that's referred in the writings. And action, we also have in the writings a lot. Let deed, let not words be your adorning, all of these passages from how the writings and you know. So let's say you're sitting in a gathering like that, and somebody uh, we look at and they, they're smiling. There's a smile on their face. What would be the most likely feeling that you would have? Happy, very good. And what would you want to do as a result of that? Smile back, and what would you do? Smile, that's it. Now, is it possible that there is another person in that gathering and looks at the same person with the same small smile and they feel ibijis, <laughs> uncomfortable? Is it possible? Okay, what would that person want to do? Look away. Look away, disconnect. And what do they do? They disconnect. So do you, you, you ask yourself, so what in the world is going on? It's the same smile. How come two different, completely different, opposite experiences? So the answer to it is what? The way, the way we think about it. The way we choose to think about it. This is a choice. This is not a choice. What happens in the world is not a choice. We have an accident, we are born with something, we might have a marriage which is not all together. All of that can happen. The question is, where do we go to find an open window to, to find a way that helps us have a different experience. And this is where it is. And then Abdul Baha says, our thought is our reality. Man's reality is his thought. There is no way in the writing that says, well, you know, if you're a good person, good things are going to happen to you. Because guess who was the person who was the most wonderful person and a lot of bad things happened to him? Abdul Baha, right? The son of Baha'u'llah, he was the, the the um, light of the, his father's eye. And guess the hurdles of pain and anguish and trials and tribulations that came towards him, including death of his child, actually several children. It, it's just unparalleled. Not, none of us can compare with him. And you ask, well, if you know, how Allah loved him, how come he allowed all of those things to happen to him? And that would be a good question to ask. And the answer to it would be very helpful to us. Because, again, this is not a choice, but this is a choice. And then the question is, why? And the answer is, that is where psychology does not enter. But movie theaters and, and all of that, they know about it. And that is called what? Or the Darth Vader and the Luke Skywalker, right? <laughs> that is, and the two selves, that is mentioned in the writings. We all have the two of them with us. And some years ago, I was at a conference. For the first time ever, a three, four hundred psychotherapists came together for the first time to look at the whole notion of spirituality and psychotherapy. 
It was so unusual. One came from University of Arizona, where she was just too, starting to introduce the concept of meditation. And she was so worried about people not wanting to listen to her and not finding her credible that she was trying all kinds of ways and they were trying to convince that she's a very credible person. The more we search for ourselves, the less likely we are to find ourselves. And the more we search for God and to serve our fellow men, the more profoundly will we become acquainted with ourselves and the more inwardly assured. This is one of the great spiritual laws of life. Show me a thing. You see how far, you know, how different, how unique, how mm, the whole direction that we have is so out of the view or the mind or the box that psychotherapy at this point has. So, so the question is, how do we find ourselves um, by looking in the writings? That's a very good question to have. How do, I, how do I get to know me by reading the writing? What, what writing have you ever read that t told you something about you? Anybody here? Have you read the passage that told you something about you? Yes. Yes, you Noble have I created thee by thou hast a face Exactly. So he said, well, you know what he says? He created me noble. Hmm, am I noble? Oh, I don't know about that. I mean, you know, I have to figure that thing out. You know, sometimes I'm noble, sometimes I'm not. Sometimes I'm really, hmm. Uh, <laughs> and sometimes I'm nice. <laughs> what, what does he say about that? And then another question comes to your mind. What is he talking about? Am I always going to be noble? Am I sometimes going to be noble? Am I noble to my um, spouse? Am I noble to my children? Am I noble to my colleagues? How do I know? <laughs> so mm, this becomes more of a question. And we need to be OK to ask ourselves, how do I apply this? I think what I find with us as Baha'is is that we read the writings, we um, process it intellectually, but we don't know how to apply it. And we don't even go there, because we don't know how to do it. We memorize it. We answer cognitively, you know. What does that sentence say? And then you repeat it, whatever. But what does that do for me as far as application? Nothing. And that is something that we need to do. Apply. Why? How do I get, how do I get to see myself and know myself by looking in the writings? Where am I? Self has really two meanings, or is used in two senses in the Baha'i writings. One is self the identity of the individual created by God. This is the self mentioned in such passages as, the, as he hath known God who hath known himself, etc. The other self is the ego, the dark animalistic heritage each one of us has, the lower nature that can develop into a monster of selfishness, brutality, lust, and so on. It is this self we must struggle against or this side of our natures in order to strengthen and free the spirit within us and help it to attain perfection. So here we know within us is a Darth Vader and a Luke Skywalker together. And the war is within. So the question is, how do you make sure which one has the force? And that is not going to be easy something because we are not only subject to our own mental um, fluctuations, but we are also subject to the environment that we are. We are around a whole bunch of people who are doing a certain kind of things. The most likely, if they are doing very elevating stuff, then our Luke Skywalker might have the force. But we are in a, in a company of a whole lot of people who are mostly coming out of their dark way to self, then most likely our dark way is going to have the force. So you have, we, have, we cannot be sitting on our own about this whole issue of who is having the force. Abu Bha is basically inviting us that we need to always observe the, the field and decide what thought, what thought is going to be running the show. That's where we look at. Which, what do we think? Are we open to alternative thoughts? Can we think about alternative thoughts? Or, is it, is it, or we become stuck on one way of thinking and we become so attached to it that we won't let it go. Um, there's a wonderful story about this um, hunter that is going for 
catching a monkey, monkey. Well, of course, you have to know monkey psychology. Anybody you wanted to relate to them, then you need to be able to know what they want, what they like. That's how we connect with each other. So, so oh yeah, I know. What do what the monkeys like? Banana. So he goes and takes a board and empties it and ties it to a tree, and then the monkey smells it, says, oh, there's a banana somewhere. And he's feeling excited and hungry, he wants to go and eat it, and the action is go in there and put his hand inside, and now he's grabbing the banana. And he's gonna pull it out, and <laughs> the hand is not coming out, because now it's bigger, right? And the monkey is looking at the hunter coming his way. And it says, what? Uh oh, death is coming my way. He's feeling Fear. scared. He wants to run away. He wants to run away. However, what happens? He is not going to let go of the banana. And because he chooses, we cannot. See, monkeys think but they cannot think about what they think. Human beings think, but we think about how we think. That's the difference. That's why our responsibility is, let go of your banana, and you go free, your marriage will go free, everything will go free, you know? But who's going to listen to that? We become stuck. And so, the reason we say prayers, because prayers kind of shift us and shakes us, and maybe it would help us to let go of the banana. And this is where, now we come to this passage. So I broke it down into, into ways that, as a psychotherapist, I would look at it and I would like to process it with a person. So, Abu Bakr gives this, um, the writings have this fascinating metaphoric um, powers, which recently science has paid attention to, by the way. And, and imageries of all kinds that, when we say prayers, if you don't go into it, it will not affect us. Just as the same way when I ask you to say, you know, I'm having a stumbling block, a problem, you go into it, it will affect you. You need to go into the writings and go into the metaphors, otherwise it's not going to, it's just going to be just washing over. So he says, just as the earth attracts everything to the center of gravity, and every object thrown upward into the space will come down, just like if I do that, so also material ideas, material ideas, and worthy thoughts attract man to the center of self. Which self? This self. The God greater self. Okay? Simple. You can write a psycho psychology book on that. And he says, anger, he's calling it, passion, ignorance. Passion. Most people say, oh, passion, passionate is good. Well, it depends about what? Prejudice, greed, envy, covetousness, jealousy, suspicion, they all do what? Prevent man from ascending to the realms of holiness. They are blocking you. Blocks. They are barriers. They are stumbling blocks. You get stuck behind them. So you have to say, God, this is a banana, I better let go of it. Let's go pray. Baha'u'llah, help me to let go of my bananas. And anything will work. Then you can get that. The first thing is one you do. So, the physical man, unassisted by the divine power. I mean, we cannot do it by ourselves. Psychotherapy, psychology, does not even come close to understanding that. Unassisted, because they want to say to you, oh yeah, my, my little one, you're great, you know what, you're great, you're just so wonderful. And they think, oh yeah, the self-esteem is going to go up. That's not the way it works. Self-esteem is not going to go up by that. Self-esteem is by you fighting yourself and conquering yourself. And then you say, well, yeah, I can do it. <laughs> so the physical man, unassisted by the divine power, trying to escape from one of these, one of these invisible enemies, he calls them will unconsciously, unconsciously, fall into the hand of another. Okay, no sooner does he attempt to soar upward than the density of the love of self. So when we talk about I love myself, we need to distinguish. Psychotherapy does not have any distinction between who. 
So I love myself, or I love my, my anger, I love my, my jealousy, I love my passion, I love my whatever, I love my fix. All of that is part of you love yourself. But Paulus said, no, we don't love the lower self. Lower self is going to bring us down. If we love it, we're going to love it. That's what the guardian said. The spiritual self, which we find in the writings, that part of ourselves, that's the part we love. That's why we have to go find it in the writings. I tell you something, it doesn't matter who comes to you, who's a Baha'i, who's not a Baha'i, whatever. The spiritual laws are the spiritual laws. Just like law of gravity is law of gravity. Do you think that law of gravity is going to only check people who believe in it? It doesn't matter, you know, if you walk on earth, law of gravity is there. There's no acknowledgement of spiritual laws in the whole field of psychotherapy. No. Spiritual laws? Mm -mm. Maybe spiritual ideas, God knows what they are. I mean, but the whole notion of spiritual law? No. Uh, the only power that is capable of delivering man from his, this captivity, it's fascinating what Abdul Khan uses the word captivity. I mean, <laughs> he's stuck with his banana. Is the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, you're going to figure out how you connect to the power of the Holy Spirit. You're going to feel that power of the Holy Spirit. You're going to prime yourself. You're going to you have to live with Holy Spirit. You're going to interact with Holy Spirit daily through your meditation, your, your prayers, to your reading the writings, reading the stories of the life of Abu Bahar, reading the stories of the life of the Bab, reading the dawn breakers. You're going to come close to this power who has been interacting and affecting and has been setting on fire so many of the believers from the very beginning of history. Unless that, it's not going to come to you out of a cognitive exercise. It's, that is not a, it's not a cognitive kind of a deal. It is an experiential something. You've got to feel it and then work with it. So the attraction of the power of the power of Holy Spirit is effective that it keeps man ever on the path upward ascension. So it just sets the tone as I want this passage to set the tone for you, what we're talking about. So your job and my job is to go figure out how to make this happen. So I see, for example, um, children, they ask me, parents, should I let my child see me when I'm praying? Because I get so emotional and tears come. I said, you bet you, you should let your child see it. Because how else are they going to see that the whole process of devotion and meditation and prayer is an emotional process? How else are they going to see it? They're not going to see the movies. They're not going to see the cannot game. They need to see it happening. Every individual must fight with himself. And what do we fight? What, are, what is the fight going on between who? Darth Vader and the Luke Skywalker. And but he must conquer himself, must overcome his lower nature, overcome it. And he says, shut up and sit down and <coughs> don't say anything. That's what you do to it. <laughs> must overcome his self and turn himself over to God so that the Holy Spirit can function through you. If you read that to um, a psychotherapist who's not Baha'i, they're going to have rash. <laughs> Turn yourself to God is going to have a rush. No, I tell you that there are some new ones, neuroscientists who have written a book called How God Changes Your Brain. Basically means whatever it is that you consider your God, the way you, this God is, if this, then we will, we will not heed the information, the knowledge that is coming our way and we would not want to hear it, therefore we don't hear it. Because we, we don't want to hear everything all, all the time. Sometimes we just choose not to, not to be there. So we come to science. My, one of my favorite researchers and scientists is John Gottman. And he did 20 years of research. And as a result, he really brought the whole field of marriage family therapy really converging towards the faith. And I'm so grateful and thankful for it. He has a training. Um, for lay people, I went to the training just I wanted to know what is he teaching to lay people so they can do workshops and groups everywhere and, and the BIH students in Iran who, who study psychology with me, I um, encourage them to use some of his techniques and then create group um, for couples 
in their city, and they do. And they, uh, they are willing to jump in there and take the risk. They don't know exactly everything, but you know, as the guardian says, you pray, you meditate, you act. Without action, prayer meditation is not going to bring you any fruit. Pray, meditate, action. After you act, you can go back and correct it. But without action, there's nothing to correct. So you'll be just stuck in the whole world of vain imaginations because there are so many geniuses that they've never done anything, so nobody knows about them because it's just in the realm of thought. So the four horses is that Gottman's discovery, which brought the whole field so much closer to the pain because he's talking about the dark Vader self without saying the lower self. And these four, uh, all of us do. Criticism, defensiveness, somebody criticizes, and there is no constructive criticism. There is none. <laughs> when you are criticized, you go into defense mode, and that doesn't feel good, and your powers will be diminished. And so there is no criticism. In the faith, we have consultation, we have exploration, we just don't criticize people. That's not a force view, that comes from this part of us. Um, so criticism, defensiveness, mm, contempt, which is very, very important in the faith. That means I know better. That means you feel yourself big, and I know better, don't tell me what to do. And then finally, stonewalling, the person called it ah, yeah, that, which is really <laughs> deadly. That means you know the door is locked, I'm not talking, you're not talking, there's no blood going coming back, there's no <laughs> nothing, this whole body is dead, the marriage is dead, finished, that's it, and then you have well, what can you do? Well, I tell you what you do. You say, you know what, I'm really, really so upset right now. I'm afraid if I say anything, I might regret it. So how about if I go take a time out? I go take a shower, I go say some prayers, I go watch a movie, I don't know, whatever, but don't go drive. And I come, yeah, because you're out of your mind, you don't want to go drive. Um, so then I will come back. And I will listen to you to understand. Remembering that listening to understand is different than listening to agree. It has nothing to do with it. Once I, once I told one of the, one of the wonderful friends um, that when, I, when I'm listening to someone, he said, why are you listening to these people? You're not supposed to be listening because they think, they think they're right. I said, it has nothing to do with that. I'm just listening to understand. Mm, I'm not saying I agree. Um, so you have to make distinction between understanding and agreeing, they're not the same. Again, the believers must be tolerant of each other. That means, go away your thoughts, go look at some of the writings, go see a prayer for forgiveness, go see something, go read something, go read a story about how to all handle it, so your alternative thoughts are available to you. There's, um, of each other's weaknesses and mistakes, because we make it. And ever ready to forgive and forget the past because in harmony, whatever the cause, is sure to prevent the community from growing. So we have something bigger to worry about than ourselves and our, our mood and our pers person or take it personally. So we always have to have something bigger. That's why marriages, when they have children, if the parents are wise, they might be able to find something to negotiate and, and not to sink the ship. I would summarize this, um, this uh, because, um, because of the time. Basically, what I'm very interested in says, when we um, not um, our spiritual self, um, and we compromise our, the laws of the faith, basically, because something we do, it just makes our lower self look way or happy, then we are really compromising our whole future and we bring more problem to ourselves. Basically, in psychotherapy, we call it self-destructive. But what, what I would say is we do a lot more spiritual self-destruction than we do this one. But unfortunately, this one, when we give this power to this one, the whole building will come down. Um, I'm reminded, Nicole is telling me um, that this is a good time to start questions. So if um, what I'm saying brings questions to your mind, don't hesitate to tell me, otherwise I'm going to run through it. Yes. Um, and so with all of this in mind as Baha'is and those of us who are seeking therapy, how do you, uh, what do you suggest we look for in a therapist? How do we interview them to find the right therapist that has 
an understanding of the spiritual side of it? Okay. How do we find the right therapist? Very good question. Right. Well answered. Wonderful question. Uh, first of all, you find a therapist who has some degree of understanding about that there is a Darth Vader and Luke Skywalker said. By the way, <laughs> they, they, if you say it that way, then they could understand. And then if you open the doors and you say to them, you know what, I think that I'm not perfect and whatever it is that is there, I would like to connect with my strength, with my spiritual thoughts, with alternative thoughts which takes me to a different um, zone, or to a different set of experiences. And I want you to be very um, um, uh, careful and very attentive to what I say because I don't want to defend um, everything that I think. So, so right there you're just guiding them um, to go in that direction of um, checking the thought. The other thing is you choose a psychotherapist that is not about an aha, aha you kind of a person. Because there are a lot of psychotherapists that believe that all, all they have to do is to listen to your feelings and then you just say, oh, 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 oh. What, 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 what is going to do for you? I mean, you're going to remain in your own, so you just become a blind leading a blind, you know. What, where are you going to go? We need to look at this, okay. Look at the writings. It offers us the other ways of thinking. You open up the long obligatory prayer and says, Oh God, do not look upon my hopes and my doings. Nay, rather look upon thy will that has encompassed the heavens and the earth. We just basically open our and says, You tell me what to do. Right there, our whole mind and brain opens up to possibilities. And you say, I'm here to discover possibilities. I'm not here to say I'm a, I'm a victim of something and then you just feel sorry for me and just give me something to make the other person to be bearing the power of, of being at, at fault. The minute you make somebody else at fault, what do you give up? Your powers. Your powers. Because the guardian says, there's only one person in the world we can change. You're not going to put your eggs in changing somebody else into that basket. You're going to say, you know, show me how to find my way out of here victoriously. <laughs> I'm here for victory, <laughs> not, not as a victim. And that's how you find someone who is, um, first of all, skilled to do that, because not all therapists do. And they say, do you do positive psychotherapy? Uh, do you do uh, uh, CBT? Uh, are you a prag pragmatic? And then, then you start. And if it wasn't a good match, Said, thank you so much. I don't think this is a good match. But if it is a good match, you continue. You journal, and then you associate in the meantime within with friends and community who are healthy, who are strong, so you have a place to see yourself in the light. So those are some of the things I could say. Yes. Hi, how are you, by the way? Good. Good to see you. Pleasure. Always, Always ready to serve the community. I know that part. <laughs> Thank you so much. I had a comment because I was impressed on this last um, quotation because I've been reading recently about the happiness paradox that you cannot be as happy as you can be if you try to be as happy as you can be. And the reason I think is right here because it, oftentimes we think of being happy going after the apparent happiness when in reality we could be much happier if we followed uh, the uh, spiritual principles. And achieve true happiness. Actually, you, you gave the answer. You know, so it's, they say they say there is a story that comes to my mind. They said there was a dog and a fox in the neighborhood, and the dog was uh, chasing its tail. And the fox comes and says, "What you doing?" He says, "Well, I am chasing my tail because they told me it's happiness is in my tail." <laughs> and the fox says, "Well, yeah, my friend, it is true, it is in your tail, but that's not how you you catch it." He says, then how do I catch it? He said, you just walk and your tail will come. <laughs> so um, what I understand from this is you, you just m make your relationship with Baha'u'llah and Abu Baha very emotionally charged. It has to be emotionally charged. It is not a cognitive process. That means you really need to know how Abdul Baha suffered, how the guardian suffered. He talks about it. He talks about the time when Abdul Baha died and he came and he thought, well, the, the House of Justice is going to be elected and he's going to be some kind of a counseling relationship. And then he realized, oh my goodness, I am the guardian. They said he's the guardian. And he thought, oh, I'm 
not even ready. I don't even know how to. How can I be? That means death. That means as a person, I should die. I would not be able to be myself. <laughs> and he says, that's why I went for a whole year to the mountains of Switzerland and I fought with myself until I conquered myself. Then I came back and I turned myself in and I became the guardian. And then from then on, he was just the guardian. He was not going to entertain anything else. That was it. And he did an amazing, amazing legacy of the garden and you guys need to know it and read it especially the young people and his thoughts and his ways otherwise there, there will be no charge in in that fight that you have inside the there will be a yo-yo between dark Vader and luke skywalker <laughs> yes yes um my question is do you feel that uh incorporating this aspect or these ideas of spirituality with psychotherapy is effective for uh, all kinds of um, therapeutic issues that someone might come with before. A specific example I had in mind, and I'm not a psychotherapist, so my understanding of codependency might not be completely accurate, is uh, there's a Shoghi Effendi quote about how the more you search for yourself, the less likely you are to find it, and find yourself in service to others and in God. But if you were an individual that was struggling with something like codependency or... The writings are very exact. And when we paraphrase mm -hmm. it, we get into trouble. Okay. Because the words are picked, especially in Shogat and picked very carefully. So I would suggest, when you read a prayer, um, I'll explain later, you stay with every... Uh, every you, you, you pay attention to every single word and meditate on that word, why that word, why. So that's, that's very important. I'm glad you said that. Okay, go ahead. Sorry to interrupt you. Uh, no, I was just thinking, if you're an individual that's struggling with finding a sense of self-worth uh, self or acceptance or purpose without you know, relying on someone else, looking externally to serve others or the relationship with God, I mean, with incorporating spirituality still be effective or useful for helping with that? What is, where is my self-worth? What self am I talking about? Which one? This one or this one? If, my self, if, if I'm talking about my spiritual self, my spiritual self is what I read. When I read a prayer, I do it. When I say, this poor creature, or this is a broken winged bird, and his flight is very slow. Does, does Abu Bakr say, I'm a strong eagle, you know, and I'm stronger than anybody else, so I got big self-worth, and so I'm gonna be soaring because of that. Does he say that? No, he says, this is a broken winged bird. And his flight is very slow. You say that to a psychotherapist, he says, oh, you got self, you got self. I think it's probably I mean, <laughs> poor you, I'm sorry. <laughs> Good luck <laughs> asking somebody out there to come and help you. That's codependency. <laughs> well, guess what? If I believe that he will assist me, he will assist me. It's in the relationship. It's in that relationship. And if I'm willing to, to, to really go close to him and, and find out that would get me to grow, I can assure you, just that battle within myself would get, take me to heaven. Just just that. You know, there's a, um, a family member who uh, went in olden time, goes to the time of how long go to visit. And he came with a mindset that well, I don't know this Baha'u'llah, I'm going to go see over there and see what is what's so special about him. Maybe nothing is special. So he's already having some kind of a doubt. So he goes in there and he says, well, yeah, he looks like, like anybody else, you know, there's not, no big deal. So he goes back and starts talking to his friend. He, I don't see anything special. He goes, is there anything special? And um, Baha'u'llah calls him in. For whatever reason, he was merciful and he was not dealing with him in, with his uh, justice, but his uh, mercy. So he calls me. The minute he walks in, this guy sees a very bright light, just like, it's so bright that he basically faints and falls on the ground. 
So the servants come and gather him and take him up, and uh, he didn't know what happened to him. He was just absolutely just blown away. Then later on, they will give him some rose water or whatever, and they bring him in. And then Baha'u'llah tells him, teaches him, he says, Do you know how people, they train a parrot? He says, no. He says, well, they, what they do is the parrot uh, only talks to another parrot. Parrot don't speak human language. And so, as a result, what the trainer goes and hides behind a big mirror and puts the parrot in front of the mirror. And parrot looks into the mirror and sees another parrot. And so starts conversing with another parrot. Now, we know from neuroscience that we have mirror neurons. And mirror neurons means we connect emotionally with other people's brains. Basically, we live in each other's brain. And see us doing piano, seeing somebody else playing the piano, or imagining it is all the same as far as wiring our brain. It changes the way we think and the way we function. So Baha'u'llah says, yeah, we put that, and the parrot will talk to this, and this guy behind the mirror says whatever you want to say to the parrot to teach the parrot. The parrot thinks this parrot in the mirror is telling them. He says, that is why the manifestations of God are in the form of the temple of human beings. Okay, so we have to read all these stories to know the power that can transform human mind, human heart, human civilization, that's what it's for. Actually, whatever civilization we have, it's because of the religions that we've had. Now we can go farther, and we need to go farther. We need to bring our mind in harmony with the mind, the divine conductor, so we can play in his orchestra. Otherwise, you know, you go you take by your violin and it's not tuned in his, according to his, you're not going to play in the orchestra. He says, go find another master. <laughs> so this whole notion of finding ourselves, the um, uh, codependency, it just doesn't fall as far as I can see within the frame. And we want to be very codependent with Baha'u'llah and with Abu. We want to keep our eyes on whether he frowns what we do or whether he smiles is what we do. And we always bring ourselves into account each day, at the end of the day, journal. How did I do today? And it's okay. Tomorrow, my broken wing bird, the who I am, is going to be maybe a little bit more flight. It's okay. It's, life is not about the showcase. It's about growing, learning, trying, but try. Did I answer your question? I hope I did. It was a good question. <laughs> so, okay, anybody else? Yes, come over here. I want all these young people because they're going to go marry and I don't want them to marry the wrong people. And I ask this question of my students, by the way. I said, what is to you good? What is the meaning of good? And guess what? Very few people know how is, what, is, what is good, what is bad. They just don't know. They never thought about it. Or I ask, what is the purpose of your life? Hmm, I never thought about it. I ask all my patients, what's the purpose? Where, where are you going? What's the purpose? Oh, I never thought about it. Well, you, if you're a ship and you don't have any destination, you never know whether you're lost or not, because you're just wondering, you know? <laughs> so, um, when I say I am having peace, <laughs> it reminds me of Mark Twain. <laughs> he says, if you're at peace with yourself, you must have a bad memory. <laughs> Because how can we be in peace with ourselves with all the things that we're doing? Abu Ha says, that, um, this is the definition of good. You, if you do whatever you do, it only benefits you. You're the farthest away from good. You're right there. You know, right there. He says, if you do something, it benefits you. And a few people around you, you've got a little bit of good around you. The faith, by the way, is not a tribal civilization. I went to a funeral, <laughs> and, uh, and I, as I enter, everybody calls, Oh, hi, k how are you? I said, Oh, I'm very well. I would give this book, they really love me. And then when I started to sit, they said, Oh, no, you cannot sit over here because they're taken. I said, hmm. And then, Oh, no, you cannot sit over there. I said, Oh, wow. I said, what, are they, what is the distinction between me? Because they got them and they said, Oh, hi, I love you. And what's the distinction? I said, You know what? Okay, I'm going to go find a place, a whole row empty with me, and I'm going to make sure that I will not save it for anybody. Whoever comes can sit. So <laughs> I go over there and sit, and there are a whole bunch of people on this side, and they say, um, oh, can we save this for I said, no, 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 we're not saving for anybody, because whoever has come to this funeral is going to be my friend. <laughs> so somebody actually walked in there and said, can I sit here? I said, by all means. 
<laughs> and we had the most wonderful conversation about how we we're going to celebrate the birth, the twin birth. Um, so we are not a tribal community. And we forget the way we act, we act like a tribal community. Because, oh, so-and-so is my friend, so-and-so I know. Um, I would laugh with them, I would walk with them, but not with others. What's the difference? Um, so we need to practice. This, this mentality of the Germans, or whoever it is in the world today, is a lot of it is tribal mentality. And as a result, we have all the wars that we have right now. Paola came to tell us that we are one cell in this big body. So, Abdul Baha says, you know, if you only benefit just a few people around you, you're having a little of good. Ultimately, Muhammad says in Abdul Baha, if your circle of good includes everybody in the world, that means you are pain because there's poverty. You are pain because other people are having pain. You are pain because others are not having home. You are pain. You are not at peace every morning when you get up because all this suffering is going on. How in the world can anybody have peace within them and look at the world as we do? I would be not wanting to be really in their company because that's a sign of a self-centered mentality. And this self. How can we do that? So that's the way we start the argument. It's, so the argument is not about, well, I can convince myself, because we can. We can rationalize. That's why we go to the writings. That's why we go and change ourselves. Because we don't have an inner compass on our own. There is none. Believe it or not, we just don't have a compass. We have to go, and our compass is in the writings. That's why it says, Unaided and unassisted, we cannot liberate ourselves from our own self. We become very comfortable with it. We get accustomed to ourselves, our lower self. So in order to do that, we have consultation, we have reading the writings, we have meditation, the whole obligatory prayer, long obligatory prayer. If you read a story about the life of Abdul Baha and then say your obligatory prayer, it has a lot more meaning than if you just go, sit down, if you chant it, it has a lot. And it will never end until the end of your life. Every time you say it, you will find something more about yourself. You're in that prayer, right there. You'll find yourself, parcel yourself. I remember once I was teaching at Bosch and there was this part of the obligatory prayer says, this wretched creature, and this woman says, I'm sorry, I will never say that word when I say the prayer. I said, no. She says, no, I don't, I don't feel wretched. Well, for her should be a question. Why did Baha'u'llah put that in that prayer, which is for everybody? Why? Why we would be all able to say that? What's the reason? That's the way we look at the writing. Questioning to understand it, rather than deciding based on our own limited understanding and closing the door to ourselves. Oh no, there's no king. Who says there's a king? <laughs> it's a dark we're going. You see the king? No. You see the king? No. Oh, there's no king. But the king is always with us. Always with us. Okay. So who else? Who else has questions? Oh, 10 minutes. Nicole, thank you so much. She keeps me on my toes. Okay. Um, any other questions? If not, Uh, I know some researchers use this term spiritual intelligence. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you're familiar with this term and if it is in agreement with uh, your understanding. Well, I have a nonprofit organization, Center for Global Integrated Education. And in um, 2004, we invited um, 120 what, scholars from all over the world, 30 of them from China, the foremost universities, they came just to explore the meaning of the word spiritual in human relationship and education. It was fascinating, the, the, the widespread of this uh, inquiry. When people are not really acquainted, um, familiar, have not dived in, meditated, reflected, um, with the laws, the spiritual laws that are explained in the Baha'i writings, Nobody even talks about laws, spiritual laws. We hear the, the word laws. Uh, then the whole notion of their understanding of spiritual is very limited up to this time. Is When we say spiritual, we say make this youth radiant. Where do we get the radiance from? 
We don't have it from within ourselves. We, when we hear from Baha'u'llah, it says, the candle of thine heart is lighted. Not yourself. You cannot lit yourself by yourself. It's impossible. Quench it not with the contrary winds of self and passion. 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 Passion is a very bad thing, whatever it is, because passion has got the, the power of hijacking us and getting us stuck to our bananas, because that's what passion does. Right? The, the candle of thine heart is lighted by the hand of my power, quench it not with the contrary winds of self and passion. Who's our enemy? Ourselves. Ourselves. So how can we be our own guide without his hand? And what spiritual we're talking about, I think is good for dialogue. And I think Baha'is need to get into the dialogue. But there is so much that you need to learn in the language of speaking with people who would like to explore these subjects. And that's what the House of Justice says. We need to know how to have a dialogue with people who are trying to find a way, but they don't know where to go find it. And we need to be the example, so they would want to know what is it that we have, be curious, what is it that we have, so we need to present something. They say, oh, i got to go figure out from this person. They got something I don't know, it's amazing. And they will be feeling curious, and they want to come and sit down with you, and then you get into a dialogue, and that's what we want. So don't close the doors. But do your homework and keep asking questions. Whatever you, under, you don't understand in the writing, if you don't know how to apply it, then you don't know it. Go back and try to see, how do I apply it? I'm going to give you one interesting example. Five minutes. Um, I had a whole bunch of couples in our area saying to me, we want to come over and we want you to do some couples gatherings based on the Baha'i um, concept for us. I said, okay. So there were about 12 couples came over at my house. I said, well, the exercise, this is what I asked them to do. And it's magic. And one of the things that we did was, I asked the couples, I said, you each select a prayer that in your mind is a explanation of who your spouse is. And they all sat down and they all found the prayer. And then they each said the prayer that they thought this was their spouse. There was not an eye dry in that gathering. Every single one of them said, that's me. That is me. That is me. And all it was the spouse was reading was another was a prayer. That's me. So we are in the writings. And that's how we need to know each other. 